Welcome. It's February 2016, and this is API Conversations number two with Mark O'Connell, field investigator, blogger, and J. Allen Hynek biographer. I'm here with Mark O'Connell. Mark is probably best known as the blogger of HighStrangenessUFO.com. And uh, he is a, I guess, am I correct saying a former uh, science fiction screenwriter? Um, (laughs) Sure, that's fair. I wrote a few Star Trek episodes in the 90s, so that's former. Yeah, okay. (laughs) Uh, the, uh, now one of the things that I really wanted to talk to you about, Mark, is that, um, I know you're working on a book on J. Allen Hynek Mm -hmm. and you've had access to a lot of archives that I don't know if any other writers ever dug into before. So it's, it's been a huge job, but it's, I tell you what, it's been a lot of fun. Um, most recently, I guess the, the most recent archive I've dug into was at Ohio Wesleyan University, which is where Heineck had his first professional teaching position after getting his uh, PhD oh. from University of Chicago. Uh, so they had, they had a whole assortment of uh, old uh, campus newspapers that had articles with Heineck mentioned in them. Hmm. And this is going back to, you know, late 1930s, 1940s. Oh, okay. Well, before he was involved in UFO investigation. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and he ended up uh, at uh, Northwestern, is that correct? Yeah, he spent, he uh, after he got his PhD, he taught at Ohio Wesleyan and at the Ohio State University. Um, it was sort of a co, I'm not, I can't figure out exactly how they worked it, but he, he taught at both universities. Um and then took a leave of absence in the late 1950s to work at the Smithsonian Astrophysics Observatory in Cambridge, Massachusetts. That's when he was hired to develop the satellite tracking system for uh, for the United States' first satellite, which mm. ended up not working out quite as planned because Sputnik got there first. But then after that, in 1960, he worked at uh, Northwestern University, became the chair of their astronomy department, and worked there until the early 80s. And he he died in eighty six. Yeah, yeah. Now um, he was a uh, a mentor of Jacques Vallée, was he not? Yeah, he was. The two of them had a very interesting relationship. I am I am hoping to interview Doctor Vallée for the book. Uh, I don't know if that's going to happen or not, but I I have my fingers crossed. But yeah, in the in the early nineteen sixties. Valet was studying at Northwestern computer science. He was a computer scientist um, and sort of fell in along with a couple other uh, a couple other folks on campus, sort of fell in with Heineck at the Dearborn University. And uh, they sort of started to form, I guess, what eventually became the Invisible College, this little group of group of uh, scientists and, and um, um, investigators who were intrigued by the UFO phenomenon, didn't think enough was being done to study it, and decided to sort of start their own little study group. Yeah, and, and uh, but how, how did, he, so he, um, he and Heideck engaged in investigations together, or did they? Well, what, a lot of it was, um, Valet was still spending a lot of time back in France, and he knew um, he knew people in France like Claude Poher and Amy Michel, and they were doing some interesting scientific work on the UFO problem in France. Uh, I can't remember when Gapan, the French government's official UFO research organization, I can't remember offhand when that started. Um, but he would come back from France and tell Heineck, "Hey, you know, they're doing some. They're actually applying scientific methods." to the investigation of the UFO phenomenon. You really should look into this. 
And Hynek got very interested in that, and you know, for a while they were they were looking at the the uh, what was it the straight line theory. Uh, the, the investigators in France were were looking at the possibility that UFO sightings that when they when they had a UFO flap that the sightings essentially took 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 place in a straight line, a straight geographical line. And I don't know if Heineck was ever really completely enthused by that theory in particular, but he was enthused by the fact that there were other scientists out there that were approaching the phenomenon as a scientific problem and applying the scientific method to actually researching it. So Heineck was very interested in that. And he, and he I think that kind of formed the basis of his and Valet's friendship. Um, and, and, you know, Valet worked with him at Northwestern for, I think, four or five years through the early 60s, and then they maintained a very close relationship after that for a long, long time. Right now, um, when, when did Heineck get involved with Project Blue Book? Well, in uh, 19, it was 19, late, late 47, early 48, I can't remember the exact date, but it was, you know, after the Kenneth Arnold sighting in the summer of 1947, um, and then the Mantell crash, which I believe was January 58, so about six or seven months later, uh, and the Air Force was suddenly faced with a real PR problem. Um, their, their, their one and only job is to keep our, our air safe after World War II, and they were failing miserably at it because these strange objects were appearing in our airspace, that they couldn't track, they couldn't, they couldn't chase, they couldn't identify. Uh, and after the Mantell crash, in which an Air National Guard pilot crashed while pursuing a UFO in Kentucky, um, the, the official explanation for that was that Captain Mantell had been chasing the planet Venus in the evening sky, and the Air Force needed a scientist to verify this. It was a plausible, or it seemed a plausible explanation at the time, but there was some skepticism among the public and, and the press. So the Air Force decided that they needed a scientist to back them up. So they, um, Heineck was a known quantity because he had he had done a lot of government work during World War II and after World War II. He was he was uh, doing he was getting a lot of grants from from the government to do scientific work. Defense, mostly defense-related scientific work. Um, so he was a known quantity. So the Air Force, uh, the Air Force folks at Wright Patterson uh, in in Dayton, Ohio, just drove up the drove up the highway to Columbus to where Heineck was working at Ohio State, and asked him if he would uh, join the UFO study group, Project Sign, and take a look at the UFO cases and help them weed out the ones that were simple misidentifications of astronomical phenomena. Um, so that's how Heine got involved. He thought it would be quick, easy work, and, and it kind of was, kind of turned out to be that way for him. And uh, the Mantell crash, he agreed with the Air Force's explanation that Mantell had been, um, had misidentified Venus and had crashed while trying to, trying to pursue Venus in the sky. So that's how Heineck got involved in in uh, in forty seven and forty eight. Now is that more or less a continuous involvement from then on, or? Uh, no, when he went, he there was there was a, a finite number of cases. I can't remember the number offhand. I think it was maybe three or four hundred cases that had come into the Air Force at that point. So Heineck went through that group of cases. He was done with his work on Project Sign in in less than a year. Went through the cases, uh, was able to identify a great many of them as misidentified astronomical phenomena, Venus, comets, meteor showers, fireballs, you name it. Uh, and he was able to explain away about 80% of the cases as misidentifications of quite ordinary objects and phenomena. Uh, so he got done with that, that whole pile of uh, UFO reports and wrote up a final report and submitted it to the Air Force. And just kind of went back to Ohio State and Ohio Westland to teach and kind of forgot about the whole UFO thing for a couple of years. Now, so when did it pick up again? Well, it picked up again in 52. Um, things started really jumping when the uh, there was the big Washington merry-go-round, the big sighting over Washington, D.C., when two weekends in a row there were 
dozens and dozens of UFOs appearing in the air, the protected airspace over Washington, D.C. And once again, the Air Force was caught completely off guard, couldn't chase these things down, couldn't identify them. Um, things, uh, all of a sudden, it looked like the Air Force really didn't, didn't have a handle on things, on the UFO phenomenon. Um, so they sort of, uh, at some point, Things were in such disarray, they brought in a new project chief. By this time, it was uh, the project had changed names from Project Sign to Project Grudge, which is a pretty good indication of what their attitude was, mm-hmm. Project Grudge. Uh, things started hopping again in 52, and Project Grudge had been basically starved of resources for a couple of years. They had one investigator, and that was it. Um, and all of a sudden these big cases popping up, there was the Washington case. There was a case at a, uh, uh, um, a military base in New Jersey where uh, a radar operator track tracked an object in the sky going like, I can't remember I think 700 miles an hour or something. Uh, and all of a sudden the air force needed answers and they didn't have anybody to give them answers. So they put a new project chief in charge of project grudge, um, Edward Ruppelt. They gave more resources to Project Grudge. Eventually, they renamed it Project Blue Book, uh, made it sort of an independent project. And Ruppelt, um, he started getting inquiries from uh, people about that Mantell case back in 1948, Uh, went through the files and found out that his files were, I think it was, I think actually somebody had ruined the report by spilling coffee on it, Hmm. if I remember correctly. So he really had no information on the Mantell case. But he realized that one of the investigators, J. Allen Hynek, was still right down the road at uh, Ohio State. So he called Hynek up and said, hey, could I come by and go over this case with you? Very next day, he drives to, uh, he drives to Columbus and meets with Hynek. Hynek, of course, still has his records from Project Sign. He's a very orderly guy. And he pulls out his case files on the Mantell crash and looks them over and... Rupelt wants to know, do you know, you still, do, do you still stand by, um, you know, your judgment that it was the planet Venus? And Heinrich looks it over and he says, no, you know what? I think I was wrong. I don't think it was Venus. I don't know what it was. Because Venus matched, Venus matched in elevation and azimuth, but it didn't match in luminosity. So the object in the sky that they were looking at was far brighter. The object that Mantell was chasing was far brighter than Venus would have been. So Hynek realized it couldn't have been Venus. So that's kind of what got Hynek involved again. Uh, Captain Ruppelt was so impressed with Hynek, not only just with his, with his understanding of the UFO phenomenon, but the fact that he was willing to say, I made a mistake. I think that, I think that report was wrong. Uh, that when Ruppelt got blue book up and running again he came back to Heineck and said you know I'd like to put you back to work uh, and actually it, it sort of happened in a roundabout way through uh, Battelle, Battelle Memorial Institute a uh, research company in Ohio they were doing some they were doing some work for Project Blue Book the whole, le- the whole scheme gets very complicated around this time but Heineck was hired to go around the country and interview fellow astronomers and find out what astronomers felt about the UFO phenomenon so that was kind of Hynek's reintroduction to working on the UFO project. And so he spent some time traveling around the country, meeting with astronomers, and found that about, I think, 10 or 11% of the astronomers he talked to um, were, to say they were believers is probably too strong a word, but they were certainly, about 10% of the astronomers um, felt that it was a real phenomenon that should be looked into. Hmm. And that was, that was pretty surprising. That was a surprising amount. Yeah. Now, now Heineck, uh, with that point, he, he was officially, uh, working for the air force, right? And well, again, he, he came back into it sort of in a roundabout way as a subcontractor to Battelle, which was a contractor to project blue book. Right. But then eventually, but then after he did, after he did the, um, the survey of the astronomers, uh, a case came up in South Dakota and North Dakota where basically Blue Book brought Hynek back on officially, except this time not just as, 
not just as someone to analyze the reports, but as an actual field investigator. Um, so in the early 50s, Heineck actually was sent out to South Dakota and North Dakota to investigate an event. So that, that's when he really became fully, fully engaged again in Project Blue Book. Now, was there a, a point in his career where he went from being a uh, hardcore debunker to saying, hey, there might be something to this? Or was that sort of a very gradual turn? It, it, was, it was gradual. It started in the early 50s, but it didn't re, the, the process didn't really um, come to completion until really getting into the 19, early 1960s. It's funny because I just um, I did an interview a while back for this TV show on uh, the Travel Channel, Mysteries at the Monument. Mm -hmm. And they really wanted to tell the story about how the swamp gas incident had changed Heineck's mind. And I said, well, it's not, it's not that simple. <laughs> Heineck's, Heineck's change of mind took place over many, many years. And they were, and the producers of the show were kind of like, okay, that's great, but we still want to say it was instantaneous. <laughs> so, so that, so the, so the segment of the show is a little, is a little odd because you've got me saying it took a lot of time. And then you've got the narrator saying it happened overnight. <laughs> um, but it really took a little time. But really what happened was when when uh, Ruppelt sought Heineck out in 1952, what really impressed Heineck was it wasn't that the cases had gotten any better or that, um, you know, anything new had been learned about the phenomenon. What impressed Heineck was the fact simply that the phenomenon had persisted. Here it is four years after he had been involved in Project Sign and people are still reporting UFO sightings even even more than they have been back then and he was really struck by that he thought that the he thought it was just a post war he thought it was kind of a you know a post traumatic stress situation he thought that americans were just so um so traumatized by pearl harbor that they were just worried about anything in the sky and of course, they were thinking in terms of Russian Soviet missiles, of course, ICBMs yeah. in the sky coming to wipe us out. That's what Heineck put it down to. He just thought it was he just thought it was nerves, jitters. So, you know, he gets called back in four years later and he finds out that there's still just as many cases being reported. And he starts thinking, huh, maybe there's something more to this than I originally thought. And what's more. Not only was it still going on, but he starts going through these cases and he realizes that that ratio still holds. There are still about 20% of the cases that can't be explained. Four years ago, he was thinking, well, you know, I was explaining away 80% of the cases. I was doing pretty good. Four years later, he looks at those same numbers and he's thinking, wow, 20% are still unexplained. That's not good. Hmm. Something, something weird must be going on here. Yeah. So that's how it started. But again, yeah. it took a long time for him to really do the full conversion, now, what, which frustrated what, a lot of people. Right. Now, was his his work uh, in the 50s shaped by the Robertson panel's sort of requirement to debunk and belittle UFOs? Or? <laughs> well, yeah. I mean, there was no escaping that. You know, especially especially when, um, you know, Pro Project Sign was, if anything, pro extraterrestrial. You know, they they filed their their they filed their estimate of their famous estimate of the situation in the late '40s, saying that we really think there might be something extraterrestrial going on here. Well, that got squashed real fast, and when Project Grudge came about. Uh, Project Grudge's mission was to make the UFO uh, phenomenon go away, <laughs> just make it go away. Mm -hmm. So yeah, so Heineck was, but Heineck wasn't really active in the program during that phase. When he got back in, uh, the pendulum had kind of swung back. Captain Ruppelt was much more, um, much. Uh, I guess I could say he was open-minded. He wasn't biased towards um, any one explanation for the phenomenon. He didn't go. F he he wasn't biased towards the extraterrestrial phenomenon. He wasn't biased towards the Soviet 
secret weapon uh, e explanation either. He had an open mind about it. So when Heine got involved again, he was working with Ruppelt, and there was a much more open-minded attitude. Um, unfortunately, everybody above Ruppelt <laughs> followed the Robertson panel's recommendation of basically saying, no, we can't, we can't acknowledge that these exist. So, you know, to a certain degree, yes, Heine was always kind of caught in that vice. Yeah. Now, um, what interested you about writing about Heineck? What, what was the, what triggered that? Well, I, I started writing my blog about, I guess it'll be five years this summer. Um, and just needed a blog has a huge appetite for new material. So I would spend a lot of time just, you know, surfing online, looking for interesting UFO things to read about and, going back through my old boxes of books and reading all the old UFO books that, you know, I've had for 20 or 30 years, but I haven't read in all that time. And, um, I came across it one day, I came across the website for KUFOS, uh, the J. Allen Hynek Center for UFO Studies in Evanston, Illinois. And I thought, aha, at the time my wife was working in Chicago and we spent, we were sort of spending a lot of time in Chicago every week. Uh, splitting our time between Chicago and Southern Wisconsin. So I'm looking at Kufos' website and realizing, holy cow, here's this UFO research foundation that's like five miles away from our apartment in Chicago. So I contacted Kufos, got in touch with Mark Rodiger, who's the scientific director of the center, exchanged a few emails, and I, I asked him if I could come over and look at their look at their files, look at their library, and just sort of look for fun things to write about for my blog. So he invited me over. And uh, sadly, what Kufos is now is all of their archives are split up between a couple of people's basements in Chicago. They're very well looked after, but, but you know, they're still just kind of stashed away in private basements, unfortunately. Hmm. Um, but I, I went over to Mark's house a couple of times and just had so much fun talking to him and Looking through Kufos's material, they just have a wealth of, of fascinating material on old UFO cases and UFO researchers and just, just an amazing amount of information. And, and Mark Rodiger is just, I mean, he's just a font of UFO information. This guy knows so much about the phenomenon. He's been there for so long. So I was just having a great time visiting at Kufos. And Mark seemed to enjoy what I was doing with my blog. And one day we were talking and he said, you know, we've always wanted to find a writer to uh, write the definitive account of Dr. Hynek's career. And I just said, could I be the writer, please? You know, I put my hand up right away. I said, I'd, I'd be really interested in that. What do you think? And, and Mark said, if, you know, if you want to go for it, I, I think you should. So, um, so kind of from that moment on, I sort of went into... Uh, not just researching for fun for my blog, but researching seriously to write a book project. So that started a couple of years ago. Um, and I had been, um, I had been aware of Dr. Hynek's work. Um, of course I knew the whole story about how he had come up with the title for the movie Close Encounters of the Third Kind uh, you know, I knew that Heineck had done a whole lot of work in the UFO field, but I didn't know a whole lot of detail about his work. So when Mark and I started talking about this book project, we both agreed that the book should be about both of his careers as an astronomer and as a UFO researcher, because the two careers, you can't really separate them. You know, both of those careers really informed each other in a lot of really interesting ways. So that kind of shaped the book. So that's, that's how I got started. So I've been working on it for the last couple of years now. Hmm. Now, uh, have your, has your view of Heineck changed much uh, since you started digging into the archives and learning more about him? Yeah, very, very definitely. Um, you know, all, what I knew from conventional wisdom about Heineck was that he was, um, he he was kind of a weakling. He was kind of a timid, ineffective um, person who let the Air Force walk all over him, um, that he really kind of wasted all his opportunities to 
to you know to 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 get some serious attention paid to the USO, US UFO phenomenon because uh, there, there's a lot out there written about that 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 portrays Heineck that way, and that's you know that that's kind of all I knew, and I started started you know reading about his life and reading his papers and his writings and just realized that there's there's a lot more to him than that. Um, he, he, he was far from a weak, shy, he, he was not, I mean, you could, pre, you, you could maybe describe him as a shrinking violet. It's not like he was the most forceful and aggressive personality out there, but he, but he wasn't a chicken and he didn't just crumble in the face of the air force. I mean, and I guess what first kind of, um, what first crystallized that for me was I started reading about, um, this, uh, convention he went to in the early 1950s, 52, I believe. It's right around the time he did the survey of the astronomers. He, um, he attended a meeting of the uh, American Society of, or the American Optical Society. Okay, so a professional group of optical physicists. They were having their annual convention, having a symposium, and they brought in three scientists to give, to deliver papers on the UFO phenomenon. Uh, one of them was Donald Menzel, who um, was working at the Harvard Observatory. Mm-hmm. Uh, one of them was, um, uh, what's his name, Erner Liddell, I think, who was, I can't remember. I don't, I don't have the statistics in front of me, but he was kind of a big wig in the scientific world at the time, Erner Liddell. So both of these guys get up and deliver papers in which they just basically skewer the entire UFO phenomenon and say, you know, you know what's behind this is people are stupid. That's what's behind this. There's really not anything going on. It's just temperature inversions and um, ice crystals in clouds causing reflections that are making people think that they're seeing things in the sky. So these two heavyweights get up in front of this convention of scientists and they deliver that message to these scientists. Well, the third scientist to give a talk that day was J. Allen Hynek. And nobody knew who he was. He's an assistant professor of astronomy at Ohio State University. Nobody's ever heard of him. He's, you know, he's small potatoes, as he would say. So he gets up and he starts criticizing the other two scientists. He starts criticizing Menzel and Little and saying, you know, these guys haven't given this any thought. They don't even understand what's going on. They don't know the data. They don't know enough to be able to express an opinion. And to me, that was a pretty gutsy move. That's something that could have killed somebody's career. To get up in front of a a meeting of your fellow scientists, your professional peers, nobody knows who you are, and you start criticizing the two guys who just gave papers ahead of you, I think that's pretty gutsy. Mm -hmm. And it it could have ruined his career, but it didn't. Heineck, Heineck had some kind of charm going for him where he could cross people way up on the food chain, way higher on the food chain than he was, and he would get away with it. He wouldn't have to, he wouldn't have to pay any, you know, there wouldn't be any, any negative consequences for him. So that, that incident and a couple others kind of made me realize, no, people, people really have Heineck wrong. He wasn't a meek guy. He wasn't a coward. He didn't just fold. He actually was a man of principle. He just went about things in a very quiet and patient way. Uh, I, I presume you've seen a fair bit of his private correspondence in those yeah. archives. Uh, was he, uh, you know, in, in private, wa- was he a different character than in public? To a certain degree. I mean, Mark Rodiger gave me a good quote one of the times we were talking uh, and he said, you know, he said, he said, Alan wasn't always a hundred percent on the level about his feelings about UFOs in his public comments. But if you would have dinner with him at his house that night, he could, he might tell you a very different story. So yeah, there was a certain amount of, there was a certain amount of, he had, you know, to a certain degree, he had to play a political game in the scientific community not always be completely open and forthright about his opinions. Um, and of course that drove a lot of people crazy. A lot of people thought that a lot of people were angry with him, with him because, um, he wouldn't always speak his mind. He would sometimes sort of hold back on things. 
again, I, I didn't see that as a sign that he was meek or a coward. I saw it as more of a, it was, it was kind of, that was his strategic approach to how he would handle things. But yeah, I've, I've not only have I had access to a lot of his personal correspondence, but I've, I've interviewed a lot of people who were very close with him. I interviewed one of his children. Um, I interviewed a gentleman named uh, Bill Powers, who was part of that close-knit group at Northwestern University in the early 60s. He was right there with Heineck and Valet during a lot of their work during that time. Uh, unfortunately, Bill passed away a few months after I interviewed him. But gosh, he was just—he was such a charming guy, and just had so many wonderful stories about Heineck. And you know, so I, I've been getting really interesting looks at you know Heineck, the private individual. Um, again, through going through his correspondence and from interviewing people who were close to him. Mm -hmm. Now, uh, I have to ask you about the Lonnie Zamora case. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm not sure the record's completely straight on that case. Uh, <laughs> I mean, we have Ray Stanford's version of things. Mm -hmm. uh, where did Heineck come down on that? Heineck was very puzzled. I'm glad you brought that up because that was one of the, um, that was one of the cases. You had asked before about how, how and when Heineck changed his mind. Right. You know, went went from full blown skeptic to being much more open minded about things, and, and the Zamora case definitely played a part in that transformation of his thinking. In fact, Bill Powers, the gentleman I just mentioned, who I interviewed a couple of months before he died, uh, Bill Powers went out to Socorro, New Mexico, um, to investigate that with Heineck. So I actually got some first hand info uh, from one of the original investigators of the case, which was which was pretty neat. Um, they were very perplexed by it. Now, Bill Powers was a very practical guy and he was, he leaned towards, um, the object Zamora saw as possibly being a test of some secret government vehicle. Mm -hmm. He didn't, he didn't come out and say, I believe that's what it was, but he, you know, he investigated the case pretty thoroughly. He was one of the first people on the scene after the event. And he, you know, he, he saw enough that made him think it's possible that this is an earthly, just something that our military is working on. So that was an interesting slant on things. Heineck himself though, was much more open to, um, much more open to, uh, I, I don't want to say extraterrestrial because he, you know, he never wanted to be pinned down on that. But Heineck was much more open to, I think, alternative explanations of the Zamora case. You know, the Zamora case was for a while there, that was really the gold standard of UFO cases because not, you know, Zamora reported it immediately. It wasn't like the Barney and Betty Hill case where, you know, you had to wait a couple of years before anybody actually found out what happened. Zamora reported the case immediately. He had corroboration from his for his account. There was there was physical evidence that something had been there. It was a big deal. And yeah, Heineck was Heineck was incredibly interested in the Zamora case. Yeah. Now, um, I wanted to ask you about uh, this article that came out about two or three years ago called The Secret Life of J. Allen Hynek. Uh, yeah, I'm familiar with it. Uh, Hynek had some interest, apparently as a young man, in uh, Rosicrucianism and so forth. Yes. Uh, hmm? Did he stick with that, or is that something that he just sort of was a, a youthful... He, he did stick with it, I, and I, I, I can't say with any certainty that it was a constant throughout his life, but he did go back to it, most definitely, and that, that's something that I, talked, um, that I talked with his son Paul about. So Paul gave me some insights into his dad's interest in, in Rosicrucianism. It was definitely a big deal in his life. Um, part of Paul's thinking on that was... Heineck lost both of his parents when he was very young. Uh, his, dad, his dad died when he was, I think, 14, and then his mother died three or four years later. Um, and he was, they were living with a whole bunch of extended family in, in the, on the west side of Chicago. 
So it's not like Heineck was suddenly like homeless or anything. He was still, you know, he was raised by a couple of aunts and a grandfather that he was still living with. But, you know, he was orphaned. He was orphaned at a very young age. Um, and Rosicrucianism, uh, you know, there's, there's an element to that belief system that, that, you know, includes, you know, being able to make contact with the afterlife. So it, that was an intriguing, that was an intriguing notion for, you know, a 17 year old boy who had lost both of his parents, um, and was kind of trying to find his way in life. And then Paul added to that, you know, shortly after that, Heineck ends up, uh, working for his master's and his PhD at the Yerkes Observatory in Williams Bay, Wisconsin. So he's spending night after night after night all alone in the observatory, gazing at gazing into infinity, gazing at stars. And Paul said, "You know, you really have to wonder what that, what kinds of, what kinds of things a person thinks of when he's you're a, you're a young man, you've just lost both your parents, you're trying to make your way in the world." Um, so yeah, Heine Heineck was interested in some very odd things along the line. I mean, I'm not saying Rosicrucianism was odd, but he was, he was interested in some, uh, let's say some belief systems that are not mainstream. Heineck was, Heineck was not averse to exploring alternative belief systems. Yeah. And this article says that, uh, he had rejected the notion that UFOs were nuts and bull spacecraft. Did you say he rejected that, or just he? Did, it was not something he wanted to get pinned down on. Um, I, I I'm not sure if I could answer that definitively, but he definitely didn't. He never wanted to be pinned down on nuts and bolts, and he did make several statements where he he distanced himself from the nuts and bolts concept. I don't know that he ever outright rejected it. I think he was too smart of a guy to reject any possible explanation, but there were definitely explanations that he held in much higher favor than the nuts and bolts explanation. He was never, never big on that. Uh, did he, according to, uh, apparently he told Jerome Clark he believed in elementals, uh, nature spirits, uh, or is that? that? That wouldn't surprise me. Um, I haven't come across that. Um, but I have talked with Jerome Clark, so I'll be sure and ask him about that. Okay. Um, uh, but he did, I'll tell you a couple of things, a couple of things his son told me that he was interested in. Um, well, actually Bill Powers told me a story about how Heineck had gotten interested in the work of this guy named Ted Sirios in the 1970s. Ted Sirios claimed to be able to take psychic photographs. Hmm. And he was pretty much shown to be a fraud over time. But Heineck, for a while there, Heineck was very, very fascinated with Sirius's work. And his son Paul told me that he was also very interested in the writings of, I think his name is James Monroe. Uh, Monroe is the guy who popularized the idea of the out-of-body experience. Mm -hmm. Monroe had numerous out-of-body experiences and wrote several books about them. And Heineck was very interested in that. In fact, he took Paul to a couple psychic conventions. So Heineck was interested enough, at least, that he went to a couple psychic conventions to try to learn more about things. He, like I said, he was he was not averse to alternative belief systems. I see. Now, um, you yourself have done some UFO field investigation. I understand uh, with Wisconsin Mufon. Is that correct? Yeah, that's right. I'm, I've taken a leave of absence while I finished the book. Um, but right around the time I started writing my blog, well, the two kind of went hand in hand. I, I signed up to become a, U, a UFO field investigator with MUFON right about the time I was starting to write the blog because I thought this would be a really fun thing to write about as I'm going through the experience. Mm -hmm. So, um, so yeah, and I've for, a while, for the last year or so, I've been the assistant state director and the chief investigator. It's been a really fascinating experience, and there are a couple of reasons I wanted to do it. One was just because I wanted to be, I just wanted to be in this world of UFO investigation and just see firsthand what it's all about. And, um, and I also was really interested in learning about the kinds of people who report a UFO occurrence. What makes them report a sighting? 
how does it affect them personally? How does it affect them psychologically? I just and I and and then when I started working on the book, the Heineck biography, that became even more important because I realized I am going to be writing about how Heineck, um, how Heineck worked with people who have gone through very intense UFO experiences. I need to have some sort of understanding of what that experience does to a person if I'm going to be able to tell this story properly. So it's, it's been incredibly helpful for me on, on, on that level. Um, and I've, I've come across some really, really mind bending <laughs> cases. I'll be honest with you. Um, I've had a couple just in the last year or so that were, that were extremely high strangeness cases. They're all historical cases though. So it's frustrating because most of the contemporary cases you'll get are just simple little lights in the sky, you know, nocturnal meandering lights as Heineck would have called them. And then every once in a while, every couple of months, you'll get a case that is just, just confounding. It's so fascinating, but they almost always seem to be historical cases that took place 10 years ago, 20 years ago. So you've got the witness who's reporting the case after all these years, but, but there's no way to corroborate it because there are no other supporting witnesses who can be tracked down anymore. So that, that's, that's been a really interesting part of the experience. Yeah. What, you, what have you, the, the people you have met as an investigator, would you say that they were different than you expected or the same or? Um, I, I'm not really sure what I expected to tell you the truth. So the whole experience has been kind of a, a you know, it's been one surprise after another. It's been a, a really huge learning experience. I, I am, I am really impressed by the fact that, um, people are willing to, you know, whether it's pick up a phone or go to the website and fill out a report and say, I saw this, I had this really strange experience. I saw this strange thing in the sky um, most of the time I found that the reason people fill out a report is they want to know two things. They want to know what was it, what did I see? And they want to know, has anybody else seen the same thing? Mm -hmm. That's such a big thing with witnesses. They really want to know if somebody else has seen the same thing because they need to validate their experience. And I find that very compelling in, in someone who fills out a report. That's such a natural human impulse to want to know, am I the only person who's seen this or, or has it appeared to other people? So I have found for the most part that you have people who report a UFO incident are very sincere, very genuine, uh, and really driven to report their, their experience by, you know, just some really very honest human emotion. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, I, I noticed by the way, along those same lines that, uh, a sketch on your blog looked an awful lot like a sketch one of my witnesses came up with uh, really about two or three years ago. I just, yeah, I sent you a link this, this evening. Uh, so, um, oh, I'll take I, a look. I'm gonna. I, I think it might be interesting to. I'll put in the show notes uh, the link to your blog post and the link to. Uh, oh, okay. To the sketch that I have, so people can compare it. Yeah. Um, well. I, if if we have time to talk about it, I'd love to tell you about some of the really interesting cases I've had in the last year. Yeah, let's do one or two. Okay. Well, one of them, the most recent one, this came about last summer. Uh, this was a, an event that took place in 1980. So we're already talking. It's a 35-year-old UFO sighting. The gentleman who reported it was a retired military man. And in 1980, he had been... Uh, in an infantry division in California, and his division had been flown to southern Wisconsin to guard a military base where, at the time, Castro had sort of emptied out all the prisons in Cuba and let all the prisoners emigrate to the U.S. So there was this huge flotilla, an influx of thousands of Cubans coming to the U.S., um, and a whole lot of them, a thousand or two, I, if I remember right, were brought to Fort McCoy in central Wisconsin. And things got a little bit out of hand at one point. Some of the, some of the Cuban immigrants um, stormed one of the fences at the base and knocked it down. 
And so these, this gentleman who reported the UFO case was part of the, he, he was part of the group that had to form a human fence to, to, to maintain security on the base after this, after this huge section of fence had been torn down. So he and his group, about 50 men, they're all on dude, They're all basically making a human fence 24/7 for several days. And one night, he's just gone off his his uh, he's just gone off his active rotation, and he's climbing into his sleeping bag under the stars to catch a few hours of sleep. And he sees this strange rectangular object appear from behind the trees, and it's you know it's got. It's got all sorts of different lights all over it, and there's a... First he described it as a window, but then he said it wasn't really a window because I could tell there was no glass in it. It was just an opening in the side of the object, and there seemed to be kind of a force screen covering it, and he could see the silhouettes of two humanoid figures inside, and as this object moved across the sky, it seemed to him as though the heads of these figures inside the craft were turning to watch him as it passed and then it disappeared behind some trees and he never saw it again but in the meantime he's looking up and down this row of guys forming this human fence and he said everybody's pointing up in the sky he said everybody saw it some people actually had cameras and were taking pictures so he um and he he said i was so agitated i thought i'd never sleep but then he said, I, I, hit, I put my head on my pillow and I fell asleep immediately. And he said, that's the weirdest thing about it. He's like, I was so agitated. Why did I fall asleep so fast? He's like, that never happens to me. So he, he falls asleep, deep, deep sleep, wakes up, wakes up in the morning. And he talks to his commanding officer and he just says, did you, you, know, did you see what happened last night? And his commanding officer just said, don't say a word. And the guy said, well, shouldn't we talk to the, shouldn't we tell the colonel at breakfast? And he was like, his CO said, you say anything you want, just leave me out of it. So at breakfast, he saw the base commander and he said, hey, I saw this thing, you know, come out from behind the trees last night. Should we file a report? And the base commander just kind of smiled at him and he said, I tell you what, if they write it up in the local newspaper, then we'll file a report. And he said, and the guy told me, well, there he had me because... I was on duty 24-7 as part of a human fence. There's no way I'm going to get a copy of the local paper. So he said there was no way I could ever push it, and I just had to basically give it up and forget about it. But he said it's been 35 years now, and it's been weighing on me for 35 years, and I really wanted to tell somebody about it. Now, to me, why would this guy, 35 years later, why would he come up with this story if there wasn't really something to it? And, and I realized you, you're kind of, you're placed in, in this really interesting, it's almost like you're placed in a, in a position of honor because somebody is sharing so, something with you that they have never shared with anybody else their entire life and they're sharing it with you and you really need to respect that. And the guy's story was really amazing. And he said, I've got some stuff I can send you. I have a sketch I made of the object. I have, the, he said, he was the company clerk so he actually still had the duty roster. So he sent me a, a roster of everybody who was on duty that night as part of the human fence. And we don't know how to get a hold of these people. I've right. talked to my superiors at MUFON and said, you know, this could be a really big deal. All we need is to find one person on this list who can corroborate this. And we've got something here. And I will be honest, I've gotten so little help and support from MUFON, it's, it's been a big disappointment to me. Um, I don't want to just start, you know, looking people up on Facebook and calling people up after 35 years and saying, hey, tell me about what happened at Fort McCoy in 1980, because we don't know if people want to talk about it or not. You know, there are some ethical issue, issues involved in whether you contact these people or how you contact these people, and, and I don't really know the right thing to do. So that's been a little frustrating because it was a really fascinating story, but I haven't had any way, any way to verify it. All right. So. Hey, you had another case you wanted to talk about or? Yeah, another one. Um, this one took place, if I remember, about 10 or 10 or 15 years ago. It was a, a young couple and their young boy 
who were visiting some, driving to visit some friends in northern Wisconsin. It was late at night. They were running late. They got a little lost. The sun was asleep in the back seat, so it was just just the couple away. And they're on this sort of isolated old country road. You know the story. Mm-hmm. And they see some kind of fireball in the sky. And they think it's a meteor at first, except then it kind of slows down and seems to veer towards them. And it gets closer to them, and they pull over, and this thing seems to have a row of lighted windows on it. And they think they can see people inside. And then it seems to sort of settle down on the ground across the highway from them. But the next thing they know, they're looking at a house. And they think, oh, that's funny. We didn't see that house there before. That's odd. And then they drive on to their friend's house, and they arrive at their... There's a potential missing time element here because they did arrive late at the friend's house. But it, I think, but they said it was only about 15 minutes or so, as, they, as far as they could tell. So the next day, they're driving back home, and they decide they're going to retrace their steps to see if they can figure out why they saw that weird thing last night. And so they're driving back on this road, and the house that they thought they saw, it's not there. There's no house there. There's nothing there. And, you know, again, the guy's telling me this story. I'm the first person he's ever told this story to in 15 years. He has no reason to be making this up. He has no reason to be exaggerating. It seems like it was a very real experience he had. And I said, well, could I, would your wife be willing to talk to me? And he says, well, she's my ex-wife now. And he said, I I can ask her, but I'm not sure what she'll say. So I said, well, if you could ask her, I'd really appreciate it because having her Having her testimony would be very, very helpful in this. Well, he emailed me a couple days later and he said, well, I talked to my ex-wife and she just said, there's nothing to say. I won't talk to him. So again, I've got a really, really intriguing story told by somebody who seems like a pretty credible witness, but I can't do anything with it because I can't get, I can't get any verification. It's very frustrating. That's the trouble with these historical cases. Hmm. Well, that's, uh, yeah, I've, I've had similar cases myself where the corroboration just is nowhere to be found. Or in one case, uh, maybe the husband and wife corroborate each other, but nobody else. So, yeah. Uh-huh. Yeah, that's frustrating. Um, but like I said, I, I you know, the, I kind of, the hair on the back of my neck stood up when he was telling me the story. Yeah. Uh, so there, there's a certain sort of feeling that this is, not made up or yeah because you know you when 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 you talk to enough ufo witnesses you can kind of pick up on verbal cues and you know you can you can kind of you can kind of sense the tone in their voice you can tell if they're you know you can tell if they're nervous sometimes you can be pretty sure that they're making stuff up um but you know in in both of these cases the witnesses seemed really i talked with both of them quite a bit over the phone and i and i did not since a a single false note from either one of them. Right. I had another one. I'll just tell this one really quickly. This was, didn't really have a UFO involved, but it was a woman who used to live in Wisconsin. She reported it to Wisconsin MUFON, even though it actually took place in Chicago. And it was this strange thing where she was in Chicago for business, looking, was out with a friend looking for a place to eat, found this restaurant in this strange part of town that they never expected to find a restaurant in. And went into the restaurant, sat down, had a meal. They had a meal. They were the only people in the restaurant. Um, the whole experience was sort of, they couldn't really remember many details about what they ate or anything. But the, she was back in Chicago a week later, this time with another friend, and said, hey, I went to this really interesting restaurant a week ago. Let's go. And she went to find it. She found the building where the restaurant was, and there was no restaurant there. Oh. And, it, you know, again, there's no UFO there. I don't know what's going on in this story. But, again, it was just, you know, this woman, she was a college professor. Mm-hmm. She came off as very level-headed. She's telling me this story, and the number one thing I'm sensing in her voice is she is genuinely confused. She experienced a completely inexplicable occurrence like years ago and it still bugs her because she still can't figure out what happened 
Very odd. Now, I'm Those not, are the best parts know, of the job. I have not heard that particular type of thing before. You know the. the yeah, uh, so it's it seems like lost time, but it also seems like they were in a physical space that didn't really exist. Because she said when she went back the next week, they went into the building, and she said the physical space inside the building where the restaurant had been was completely different than where what it was. When the restaurant was there a week before, there had, you know, walls had moved and there were different doorways and things. Mm. She was completely, completely confused. Right. Well, uh, Mark, uh, I think we'll wrap this up soon. Uh, let tell people uh, where they can find more about you and your your work. Well, I've, I have slowed down a little on my blog recently because of the book, but the blog is HighStrangenessUFO.com. Um, the book is, I have, I have an August 1st deadline with my publisher and we're hoping to get it out sometime in the fall. Um, so, and you know, maybe, maybe I can come back on your show then and give oh, some yeah. more, some more details about the book when it comes out. But oh, that's, yeah, for sure. that's, uh, that's what we're looking at right now for the timetable. Yeah. I, I'm, uh, I th- I'd like more, I hope, I hope I get a lot more insight into Heineck than I've gotten from the other sources that I've seen. So. Okay, good. And the name of the book is The Close Encounters Man. The Close Encounters Man. Okay. How J. Allen Hynek Made It Okay for the World to Believe in UFOs. That's the name of the book. Okay. Well, uh, thanks a lot, Mark. Thank you. It's been fun. This has been API Conversation number two with Mark O'Connell. For more information, including links to Mark's blog, please go to apicasefiles.com and look for API Conversation number two with Mark O'Connell. API Conversations is a production of Aerial Phenomenon Investigations. To learn more, please go to aerial-phenomenon.org. Music by DJ Spooky.